The Second World War fundamentally changed course for Britain on December 7th, 1941, with the Japanese assault on Pearl Harbor and subsequent entry of the United States into the conflict. Yet in the immediate aftermath, there was no guarantee America would actually declare war on Germany as well. Public opinion was outraged with the perpetrators of the attack in Tokyo, not Berlin, and though the Anglo-American staff talks had long agreed on a Germany first strategy in case of war with the Axis, it seemed unlikely Roosevelt would be able to convince Congress to declare such a war in the near future. He was saved from this dilemma by the Germans, who apparently decided a battle with the US was inevitable, and thus it was better to declare war now. It's hard to understate what a relief the United States' entry into the struggle was for Britain. It meant outright defeat, though still possible, no longer seemed likely. Even with Rommel causing chaos in Africa, the Soviet Union on the brink, and southern England still being bombarded, Churchill's once ludicrous war aim of total victory appeared like less of a pipe dream. In 1945, both the American and British empires would stand as decisive victors, but behind the scenes, the diplomats and politicians, rather than the generals, would ensure that only one emerged as global hegemon. As Washington and London were now fighting as allies, Churchill expected that all quarrels over Lend-Lease would be a thing of the past. He couldn't have been more wrong. Since the final master agreement was still to be signed, US diplomats remained relentless in their pursuit of a firm commitment on the abolition of imperial preference, the modest tariff war that protected the empire from outside competition. This was reiterated in Article 7 that demanded an explicit agreement to end trade discrimination. Churchill and the cabinet protested vigorously at such an intervention in the empire's internal affairs. Reluctantly, the State Department came up with a compromise where London was assured that for now, Article 7 did not imply specific commitments about imperial preference. With these promises in mind, on the 23rd of February 1942, the Mutual Aid Agreement was signed. This did not settle the debate over American aid permanently, and throughout the war, US public opinion would often swing sporadically against more assistance whenever there was talk about British perfidy. Worried by rumours that London was using Lend-Lease goods to undercut US manufacturers in Latin American markets, Hopkins proposed that British exports be limited to historical specialities like whiskey and Harris Tweed. The British economist sent over to negotiate, John Maynard Keynes, sarcastically suggested they might consider adding haggis. The US Treasury especially was keen to ensure the aid provided was the minimum amount needed for Britain to prosecute the war without rebuilding its strength or power. Morgenthau hoped to restrict Lend-Lease to just a narrowly defined list of war materials with the British reverting back to paying cash for goods such as sugar, fish and paper. This would ensure London's gold and dollar reserves were kept permanently low and Britain permanently weak. Whitehall was saved from this predicament by Cordell Hull, who viewed Britain as a key part of his future plan for a United Nations, which required her to be strong enough to undertake some independent action. Hull allowed knowledge of the Treasury's aims to become public, which led once again to Churchill protesting vigorously. For the sake of the alliance, Roosevelt quashed Morgenthau's agenda. Even American diplomats such as Dean Acheson were annoyed by the Treasury's activities, which, in his view, envisaged a victory where both enemies and allies were prostrate, enemies by military action, allies by bankruptcy. It's worth noting here the interesting comparison with the Soviet Union, also a recipient of Lend-Lease. After its invasion in June 1941, Roosevelt authorised an enormous order of material and $1 billion worth of credit. In return, the US demanded nothing. The humour, of course, is that liberal Britain was driven effectively to the poorhouse by Washington as its price for survival. By comparison, one of the most rancid tyrannies to ever stain the earth could hardly have been better treated. The reality is this was not a matter of ideology. Russia had little it could offer the United States other than resisting German hegemony in the short term. The British Empire, however, had the collective fruits of an imperial project dating back centuries ripe for the taking. The framing of this as a wholesale American plunder of Britain in her time of need, however, is not remotely accurate and can go too far. It was, of course, not the United States' fault that London had got herself into such a hopeless predicament, and she was well within her rights to demand concessions, even if they were stringent, in return for what was an enormous amount of economic aid, which, it must be stressed, would amount eventually to something like $22 billion worth that would not have to be paid back. 
Yet it is also true that American diplomats did not conceal their hope that the British Empire would be wound up at the end of the war, or preferably even before it. This was not just a matter of realpolitik and geopolitical competition. Anti-colonial sentiment ran deep in the American mind. In October 1942, the editors of the American Life magazine addressed an open letter to the people of England. One thing we are sure we are not fighting for is to hold the British Empire together. We don't like to put the matter so bluntly, but we don't want you to have any illusions. If your strategists are planning a war to hold the British Empire together, they will sooner or later find themselves strategizing alone. Churchill responded a month later in his famous Mansion House speech. There should be no mistake about it in any quarter. We mean to hold our own. I have not become the King's First Minister to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. The degree to which British and American diplomats talked past each other over the issue was almost farcical. Americans struggled to understand why Britain wished to hold on to what they considered relics of a bygone age. The British tended to be genuinely incredulous at what they perceived to be American grandstanding on the issue, considering the country's own problems. The more I hear, wrote Lord Halifax, referring to the treatment of African Americans in some parts of the US, the more I resent the criticisms of us in India. American hostility to the empire was not just a popular view, but also one that reached the upper echelons of power. Throughout the war, Roosevelt was in particular keen on promoting Indian independence and the return of Hong Kong to China. I do not want to be unkind or rude to the British, but in 1841, when you acquired Hong Kong, you did not acquire it by purchase. Roosevelt said to the colonial secretary, Oliver Stanley, in 1945, Let me see, Mr. President, Stanley snapped back. That was about the time of the Mexican War, wasn't it? The bottom line was that Britain in 1941 was an imperial nation, and breaking that spirit was not easily done. Our history and geography demand, said Eden, that we should remain a world power with worldwide interests. The following years, however, made this far from certain. The first months of the Anglo-American alliance were ones of unmitigated disaster. With the US Pacific fleet temporarily crippled, the Japanese swept through East Asia, Washington's Filipino protectorate was overwhelmed, along with several smaller outposts. These were large blows to the US's Far Eastern Imperium, but hardly disastrous to its prospects in the long term. For the British, the matter was very different. The fall of Hong Kong was followed by the collapse of a string of British possessions, most disastrously of all Singapore, described as London's Gibraltar of the East. The defeat shattered myths of British invincibility, perhaps more importantly, it broke the trust colonial governments had in London to provide for their safety any longer. Australia looks to America, free of any pangs as to our traditional links or kinship with the United Kingdom, Prime Minister John Curtin announced. The collapse of the British position in the Pacific meant American commanders there, perhaps not unjustly to begin with, treated their war effort with contempt. As the US Navy turned the tide later that year at Midway, commanders and politicians alike saw potential opportunity in Britain's defeat, with it looking likely that the US would have to win back European colonial possessions, they hoped to return them to the British on the basis of trusteeships. In effect, the British would only reassert control with a commitment to the colony's independence. For the most part, this was successfully resisted by British diplomats, helped greatly by the fact that the imperial war effort improved over time, particularly with the string of decisive victories against the Japanese in Burma. In the end, the British would not lose a single colony in the Pacific, or anywhere else at the final peace settlement, but American hostility to London's continued rule in the region, especially India, was clear. There was more cooperation in the Western theatres. For most of 1942, only Britain had serious forces in the field against Germany and Italy, though they met with disaster at the Siege of Tobruk. Churchill, who received the news while sat next to Roosevelt, later described the shock he felt. In this moment of crisis, the President was generous. What can we do to help? The Prime Minister wrote was Roosevelt's simple question. Logistical challenges meant a serious Axis threat to Egypt and Suez was always unlikely. But Roosevelt's assistance at the nadir of Britain's war effort was genuine, even if the American ambassador in Cairo was privately scathing at what he called British bungling. The tide of the African campaign was decisively turned in October at El Alamein, whilst the Americans followed this up by undertaking their first major ground action in the West with Operation Torch. By mid-1943, North Africa and the Middle East were secure, 
But if the military contest with the Axis in the region was over, the diplomatic contest between the Allies had only just begun. In 1942, Wendell Wilkie, former Republican candidate for the presidency, but now acting as Roosevelt's unofficial representative, landed in Cairo. His task was to show American commitment to the war and report back to Washington the state of the region. What Wilkie actually returned with was a blazing attack on the British Empire. Although generally an Anglophile, Wilkie was horrified by the squalor he saw in Egypt, for which he blamed the British. The rest of his Middle Eastern tour did not change his opinions. The veil, the fez, the sickness, the filth, the lack of education and modern industrial development, the arbitrariness of government, left him concerned America was being seen to support a colonial system he considered intolerable. Wilkie did not have the best of relationships with Churchill. During his visit to the US in 1941, the Prime Minister thought it important to ingratiate himself with a likely successor to Roosevelt. Not wanting to meet openly with the President's political rival though, Churchill had tried to arrange the audience with Wilkie clandestinely. Attempting to call him from a retreat in Palm Beach, the switchboard operator, by accident, put the Prime Minister through to Roosevelt instead. I am so glad to speak to you, gushed Churchill, before asking whether the man he thought was Wilkie might join him on his train for part of the return journey to Washington. Whom do you think you are speaking to? The voice came back. To Mr. Wendell Wilkie, am I not? No, came the answer. You are speaking to the President. Who? asked Churchill, not quite believing his ears. You are speaking to me, Franklin Roosevelt, came the reply. After some small talk, Churchill brought the conversation to a close. I presume you do not mind my having wished to speak to Wendell Wilkie, inquired Churchill. No, Roosevelt responded. Unconvinced, Churchill chose to avoid the meeting Wilkie had badly wanted so as to appear statesmanlike, to his permanent annoyance. The result was that the two men were not overly fond of each other, a situation further reinforced when Wilkie, on a trip to Moscow, very publicly called for a second front something Churchill had just spent a huge amount of energy convincing Stalin was for the moment impossible. A public rebuke in Parliament left Wilkie sour, and his subsequent report to Roosevelt was hostile in the extreme to the British presence in the Middle East. In a national broadcast to an estimated 36 million Americans, Wilkie, an appointed dig at Britain, declared America was not fighting for profit or loot or territory, or mandatory power over the lives or governments of other people. The speech earned him a visit from the British ambassador, Lord Halifax, and a heated argument. The Americans, he reported back to London, believed, we were running a bad show, and the sooner we got out, the better. In James Barr's words, there is perhaps no better summary of American thinking and policy towards Britain in the Middle East in the years that were to follow. After victory in North Africa came bickering over where to fight next. Before Torch, American planners had hoped to see a cross-channel invasion in 1943, which they correctly thought was the only way of bringing the war to an end. Churchill, on the other hand, wanted a Mediterranean campaign to potentially knock Italy out of the war and avoid such a direct clash with the Germans. US commanders were right that the Southern Front was never going to end the war, but the British were right that a cross-channel invasion in 1943, when the Luftwaffe still retained some aerial presence and the American army was yet to digest the lessons of Tunisia, could well have been a disaster. With the British Army largely still the senior force at this point, London got its way, though Churchill could feel his once unassailable authority over the war effort slipping as the Americans gained more influence. His advocated for invasion of Italy met with mixed success, giving the Allies a foothold on the continent, but also repeatedly stalemating on the highly defensible peninsula. A cross-channel invasion would still have to be mounted. Throughout 1943 and 44, US troop numbers in Britain swelled. One commentator called it an invasion. Americans were bigger, richer and better fed than British civilians. There were disagreements, particularly over segregation in the American military. But for the most part, the two nationalities got on well. Less happy was the relationship between the British and American high commands. The alliance was fortunate to have Eisenhower as supreme commander. Arguably a middling general, though he crushed one of the greatest war machines in history convincingly enough, his real talent was for politics, placating the extreme personalities among the bickering high command to hold together a united front. Despite arguments over strategy, the eventual invasion of France, Operation Overlord, was the Atlantic Alliance at its best. On June 6, 1944, the Anglo-American Canadian Armada landed in Normandy, 
and by late August, Paris had been liberated. But whilst the campaign to free Europe was ongoing, another battle was taking place across the Atlantic in the smoke-filled rooms of the Mount Washington Hotel. The official aim of the meeting between 44 nations, known as the Bretton Woods Conference, was to come up with a post-war financial order that would ensure global stability. The backdrop was a duel between British and American diplomats over who that order would benefit. The main protagonists were the US Treasury's Harry White and Britain's celebrity economist John Maynard Keynes. Keynes was undoubtedly one of the most intelligent men on either side of the Atlantic. His wit and eloquence might have made him a master diplomat, had he not, in Ben Stiles' words, been more concerned with humiliating rather than converting his opponent. Stiles sums up Keynes's plan for the post-war financial order in the following way. International transactions would be settled through a new international clearing bank. Neither national central banks or the ICB would actually hold foreign currency. Instead, national banks would buy and sell their own currencies among themselves by means of credits and debits, denominated in newly created bank money, to their ICB clearing account. Keynes later dubbed this bank money Bancor. Bancor was to have a fixed exchange rate with all members' currencies and gold. Members would add Bancors to their ICB account by exporting and have Bancors subtracted for importing, though limits would be placed on the amount of Bancors a country could accumulate through a trade surplus and on the amount of Bancor debt it could rack up through trade deficits, with each country's limit being set proportional to its percentage of world trade. Not incidentally, this method of establishing bank or quotas was convivial to British interests, as Britain had little gold but needed to conduct lots of trade. Keynes's opponent was the relatively unknown Harry Dexter White, a competent and effective member of the US Treasury. Though generally Keynesian in economics, he was enormously sympathetic to the Soviet experiment and almost certainly arranged for confidential US documents to find their way into Moscow's hands. He believed much of the United States' woes in the 1930s had been from Britain and France's competitive devaluations of their currencies. Consequently, perhaps the key part of White's plan was to establish a fixed exchange rate. He hoped to elevate the dollar to the world's sole surrogate for gold, such that cross-border gold movements would no longer have the power to dictate changes in US monetary policy. This would be entirely set at the discretion of American experts and then transmitted to the rest of the world by way of the fixed exchange rate. In sum, White's plan would bring about a world congenial to American interests. With the commitment of foreign competitors not to partake in trade discrimination or competitive devaluations, American exports would be protected. Conversely, Washington would have virtually unlimited discretion in its own economic policies. The actual outline of the two men's different plans for a new financial order are not particularly relevant to this discussion. The crux of the debate was that White wanted to make the US dollar, and only the dollar, synonymous with gold, whilst Keynes balked at the idea and the way it would undermine sterling permanently. Most of the issues surrounding the new system had been agreed before the conference convened, but on the key points not yet settled, particularly the issue of dollars being pegged to gold, it is clear that Keynes played a bad hand poorly and was outmaneuvered by White. Keynes's predicament throughout the two years of negotiations prior and then during the conference was an unenviable one. The reality was that Britain was dependent on US financial aid and would certainly leave the war with an enormous dollar shortage, meaning a loan from the American government was the only way to tide the country over until exports revived. It was thus thought Britain really had very little leverage in the negotiations. Yet tantalisingly, there was one other possibility. Wall Street, scared by the new proposed monetary policies, was prepared to lend as much as $5 billion to Britain if it walked from Bretton Woods. This loan would probably be on more stringent economic terms than that which Britain might obtain from the US government, but it would also come with no geopolitical strings, and crucially, it would have allowed British diplomats to outmaneuver White by threatening to abandon the conference. With no British cooperation, there would be no new international financial architecture, and White's plans to leave the US economically supreme would stall. A smart diplomat would have used Wall Street's offer to have obtained the best possible deal, but Keynes, partly because he was now too personally committed to the new financial architecture to war, refused to even consider it. He recognised that doing so meant his negotiations at Bretton Woods and for a post-war loan were likely to be hard, 
writing, There are quarters in the United States intending to use the grant of post-war credits to us as an opportunity for imposing the American conception of an international economic system. By this he meant abolition of imperial preference and exchange controls alongside the enthronement of the dollar atop the international monetary system. His rival, White, was at the forefront of such quarters, yet Keynes resolutely refused the obvious alternative of standing up to the Treasury and borrowing privately. Thus, whilst the British delegation demanded that countries be able to set their own exchange rates, the American view, arguing for fixed rates, won over. Keynes objected to the dollar being a gold convertible currency, which in practical terms meant that sterling would be permanently usurped whilst the United States, issuing a currency as good as gold, reaped the benefits of countries wanting to hold vast reserves of the dollar. Again, the British protested vigorously. Again, White simply ignored Keynes and snuck the clause in anyway. The refusal to contemplate walking away meant Bretton Woods is hard to even describe as a duel between the US and Britain. It was obvious White was going to win, and Keynes was just one more international delegate to be humoured. American victory at Bretton Woods was still not the end of the financial parley between both sides of the Atlantic. With the war in Europe clearly drawing to a close in autumn 1944, the question of Lend-Lease reared once more. Keynes was deployed again to negotiate stage 2 of the agreement, which was to cover Britain between victory in Europe and victory in the Pacific. The country was at this point so broke that its war effort against Japan took on a mercenary tinge, in that London was hoping to use the Pacific War as an opportunity to scale down war production and use any Lend-Lease supplies to boost exports. Naturally, the Americans were not fans of Britain using materials meant to prosecute the war to instead revive their exports, but Morgenthau was nonetheless keen the US reaction should not be harsh, instead treating Britain, as in his words, a friend who is broke with Washington making it possible for her to gradually revive trade and meet its obligations. White protested it wasn't America's job to do such a thing, as restoring British prosperity to any degree would threaten the United States' position in the post-war world. He was subsequently annoyed that Roosevelt failed to take advantage of the Second Quebec Conference to obtain commercial concessions and a guarantee not to export Lend-Lease goods in return for Stage 2 aid, Roosevelt, who up until that point apparently hadn't realised just how impoverished Britain was, switched tact and declared, I had no idea that England was broke. I will go over there and make a couple of talks and take over the British Empire. Consequently, he reinstated export restrictions on lend -lease goods and decreased promised aid by $600 million, brushing aside Morgenthau's objections that it would violate the spirit of Quebec. Churchill was not perturbed, convinced that if the programme was insufficient, Roosevelt would come through with another brainwave, as he called it. The president had other ideas, suffering not a brainwave, but a brain hemorrhage a few months later, dying on the 12th of April 1945. Much of Roosevelt's diplomacy had been based on informal talks, or was lost in his many piles of papers, which meant Britain was left with the very unknown quantity of Harry Truman as president. On the 8th of May, Germany surrendered and the war in Europe came to an end, Having only shipped about one-sixth of the arranged Lend-Lease supplies for 1945, the US now repossessed the rest. A further foundation of the wartime alliance was knocked away in July when Churchill's Conservatives were decisively beaten by Attlee's Labour at the general election. The new government had a similar policy to the last one, in that it hoped Phase 2 of Lend-Lease would allow them to begin the demobilisation of the economy, whilst America continued to provide aid. Instead, on August the 14th, Japan surrendered far earlier than expected. Truman abruptly terminated Lend-Lease aid just three days later, a crippling blow to Britain's recovery plans. Keynes, expecting a balance of payments deficit of £5.6 announced the country faced a financial Dunkirk. And so, though by this point obviously ill, he was wheeled out for a final time to negotiate with the Americans. The government hoped for a reimbursement of around $4 billion for British pre-Lend-Lease purchases from the US, along with an acknowledgement that Britain was owed a moral debt for its war effort before American entry, apparently worth $3 billion according to one diplomat. Unsurprisingly, US officials were incredulous at the idea that, having bailed Britain out in the war, they were still under some kind of moral obligation. British hopes for aid on such a basis, what Keynes called justice, were firmly scuppered, the options open to the British then were either to secure a loan from Washington or impose a brutal round of austerity back home. 
After some disillusionment, the cabinet reluctantly decided on the former, and Keynes suggested that the US offer an interest-free $5 billion loan. The American negotiator, Clayton, offered 2% interest instead. This was the best Britain was going to get, but Keynes did not take it. Instead having his head turned by a convoluted scheme from, of all people, his old rival White, that would see the US buy a large portion of Britain's sterling debt, something that would leave London only in need of $3 billion. The plan was implausible and rejected by the White House, but almost comically served to convince the Americans that Keynes was overstating British poverty and did not need $5 billion. He was told the offer was now $3.5 billion at 2% interest and $500 million to clean up Lend-Lease. Worse, any time the British seemed ready to sign, US diplomats seemed to find a new concession they wanted down the back of the sofa. Why do you persecute us like this? A depressed Keynes groaned when the Americans pushed for more concessions on British transitional rights under Bretton Woods. Eccles declared the US needed assurances it would have priority over Britain's other creditors. You cannot treat a great nation as if it were a bankrupt company, a furious Keynes snapped. No wonder that man is a Mormon, he privately muttered of Eccles. No single woman could stand him. For all of this, the eventual terms of the Anglo-American loan were generous, except in one regard. 2% interest over 50 years was by no means exorbitant, though Keynes would remain bitter it was not interest-free for the remainder of his life. In return, the Americans gained an agreement for the removal of exchange controls in just one year, and so cemented their final ascendancy over an empire that had just 30 years earlier been the centre of world finance. The British Empire was not destroyed by the Second World War, or by American hostility. Indeed, the United States' intervention from December 1941 saved Britain from defeat and permanent impotence, but Bretton Woods ensured that America's hopes of keeping the empire weak and ultimately untenable would succeed. Yet in the coming years, when the removal of the demanded exchange controls and British evacuations from her Mediterranean commitments showed just how weak Britain really was, an enormous reassessment of US policy towards the British Empire would occur, until the most serious rupture in Anglo-American relations since the Trent Affair finally ended the Great Game.